to be here. How are you? Good. Okay. Um, my name is Marcus. I'm from a studio called Us2. Um, we're a digital product studio, which basically means we come up with, design, build, and launch digital products for anything with a digital screen, really. Um, we were founded in 2004 by two best mates, hence the name, us two. Um, and we've now grown to over 250 of us, uh, based in London, Malmö, New York, and Sydney. Our goal has always been really simple as a company, to create the ultimate studio space where like-minded, passionate people can come to do the best work of their lives. And to date, I think this is probably what we're most well known for. It's a mobile game called Monument Valley. Um, did pretty well. We had about four and a half million downloads. Won an Apple Design Award, a couple of BAFTAs. And it really is a game for non-game gamers, something that anyone could enjoy, which I love about this game. Uh, and I'm not alone. Even the president likes it. Um, this is a scene from uh, House of Cards, where uh, Kevin Spacey enjoys some Monument Valley time. Um, and I know what you're thinking, how much did product placement like this cost us? And th the truth is nothing, um, which is really cool because it goes to show that if you focus wholeheartedly on quality uh, and the, the experience, good things can happen. I think because of the success of Monument Valley, a lot of people think we're a games company. Um, but we do a lot more than that. Um, we help uh, brands all over the world to launch products, services, and, and companies. This is our longest serving client, over 10 years strong relationship with Sony by now. And we grew up as a company crafting their U UI design for uh, mil millions of handsets around the world. Um, and I owe them a lot personally because the us to Nordics, the, Mal the Malmö studio grew, grew back of this very important relationship. Um, we also invest in our own products. This is Rando. It lived a short yet successful life, about one million downloads. Uh, the business model didn't work and after a hacking accident, we, d we, d we, d we decided to pull the product. Um, in the social world we live in today, with uh, vanity followers and vanity likes, we call this the world's first anti-social photo sharing app. It sounded good at the time. I guess there's a reason for social. Uh, we also love to partner up with interesting people with great ideas to launch new ventures. Uh, just some context to this one. Did you know that the average attention span for goldfish is uh, nine seconds. And recent research tells us that the average attention span for human being in 2015 is nine seconds, eight seconds, one second less, which is pretty crazy. And uh, this product called Pause, uh, which we launched four weeks ago now, is aimed at combating that kind of scatterbrained thinking to help people to de-stress and refocus. We did this with a guy called Pong, who started a mental wellness company in Copenhagen. Um, and, and it's really nice. And I have to show you this clip. Uh, we've done a lot of user te testing to validate this product. Uh, and this is one of my favorite interviews with a little guy called Christian, 13 years old, who's using pause to uh, help him deal with growing up as a teenager and, ge and generally with the uh, stress in school. Well, um, I had trouble finding reasons to do lots of the stuff that I get ideas from. And in a weird way, the pause app kind of like motivates me kind of because I have like washed away all the bad stuff and make, made room for new stuff, which motivates me in a nice way. It feels like every time I use the app, I have taken a shower. My mind has just taken a shower. It 
makes room for ideas to get out and do something like go out and get berries to maybe mash them up and make a nice smoothie for your parents when they come home. Or go out, ask your friends if you want to play like dragons and warriors and stuff like that. How amazing is that? That we can make products that makes his life better in this way. That's why I love my job. Um, so that's some of the things we've done. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about being human. Um, and the importance today of being human in our line of work. And I realized there's a bulldog on the picture there. Um, but I'll tell you why. This is, a, this is a story that has guided me a lot throughout the years of running this company. Um, in the early days of us two, when we had, we were maybe four of us and we had two clients, uh, one of them didn't really pay our invoices on time. Um, and you know, when you're that small, not being paid is a pretty big deal. So we had to find a way around this. Uh, and when the traditional way didn't work, we decided to change our approach. And my, my partner, uh, Mills, he, uh, he tried to get to know this person behind the faceless corporate invoicing department. Uh, and it turned out to be a lovely lady who absolutely loved dogs, especially bulldogs. So from that point, every time we sent an invoice, we attached this massive, colorful collage of bulldogs. And every single time, paid on time. Uh, <laughs> So it's pretty special, and I know it's a bit of a silly, silly, uh, silly story, but it has, gui it has guided me a lot, and I think in the world we live in now, with where automation and algorithms and artificial intelligence provide instant knowledge and expertise, I think being human is an uh, absolute key to get to the results quicker. Uh, and it's not just that it would be uh, a pain to live without this, at work, uh, being human, the creativity, the humor, the curiosity, etc. cetera. Um, but in our line of work with innovation, entrepreneurial thinking, collaboration, it's a must have. So I guess for me, this way of thinking about business, it's all in the culture. Uh, culture is the enabler for the great output we might produce. And when I mean culture here, it's what we do every day in our organizations, the actions and behaviors uh, of the people. Um, but culture, it's not easy. It takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of time. And uh, time is not really something we have in the fast moving world of, di uh, of digital. Um, and, and I think this is what we need to rethink, this re relationship between short-term results, where sprints, lean, return on investment rule, um, with the long-term op opportunity of creating a culture for the long-term. So I will talk a bit about that, and I will look at culture from three different angles. Uh, the organizational perspective, being a flat organization. Uh, the team perspective, uh, how we build a good team culture. And the individual perspective, wh what it's like to live in this uh, messed up world. So, first off, the organization as a whole. Um, I think you can sense when you walk into a studio or a company and where they have a strong culture, the energy in the place and the collective engagement from everyone. Um, not because they should or not because a manager says so, but because they want to, because it's all in there. And I think to get there, we really need to start as leaders to let go. And let go of control and let the community of the company show the way. And I'll explain why here. So bear with me, it's getting a little bit technical here. Uh, okay, so growth in technology is uh, accelerating like mad. We all know that. Uh, and it's not slowing down pretty crazy. And for us who work with technology, this rate of change leads to a lot of increased complexity. And with so much complexity and so much change all the time, it's hard to be an expert today. Uh, absolute truths become 
yesterday's news. Instead, I think we really need to look to exploration and experimentation to show the way forward. And to do that, we need, without experts and absolute truth, we need diverse skills and we need co co collaboration as the method. Um, and comparing collaboration and experimentation to find a way, if you compare that to the tra traditional hierarchical pyramid structures of decisions being made in a boardroom, you quickly start to understand why old ways no longer work. And even worse, fighting for that power at the top, I think, brings out the worst sides of being human, which is politics and greed and that sort of thing. So we need to collaborate, but to do that well, we need some new skills. We need to start to understand and master the art of group dynamics. Um, and within that, you need to be better at self-managing -man yourself uh, in the team. And you need to start to be more self-aware of your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, your strength in one group might be a weakness in, in another, depending on what the group dynamics is, etc. So really, to drive transformation and drive change today, I really think we need to start to look to people and culture for answers to this one. Not five-year strategies, not boardrooms full of ex executives. Good old people and, 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 cal and culture. The sort of human uh, qualities. And some of the things we're doing, um, I think in mainstream media, uh, um, companies are often portrayed as uh, cutthroat, backstabbing, etc. That's what you need to do to be good at business. And I think we're working quite hard on uh, flipping that assumption on its head. Um, and we want people to really turn up at work as them, their whole selves. Uh, and. Um, this, this picture here is from our yearly summer holiday where all us two studios get, get together and uh, have a four-day holiday, basically, that foc focus almost entirely on the relationship building, the bonding, the fun, the laughter, uh, etc. And I think we spend maybe 15, 20% of our yearly overhead budgets on relationship building in form of socials and parties and fun activities and bonding activities, etc. Um, but I think it's absolutely crucial that money can't be spent any better because the relationships and the friendships and the connections you get there is, uh, is worth money. Um, and I think when you start breaking down these corporate or uh, work hat barriers and you start to really connect and you start to really build these relationships, good things start to happen. Uh, people are starting to take a lot more responsibility and a collective ownership of the studio's f future. And our aim is uh, to have everyone driving the company forward, not just the select few in, in the, with the right titles, for example. Um, so uh, some of the initiatives we do uh, in terms of distributing as much leadership as possible is we have one initiative now where we try to make all the big important decisions together as a collective. Uh, that is decisions that affect everyone, like big budget changes, new strategic directions, new key hires, etc. We make them as a group. And then you have 80 people, which is, in my case, in this studio, driving and helping turn that decision into action much more effectively. Um, but collective ownership and collective drive also need collective rewards. And that's something we spend a lot of time thinking about, how to reward everyone in the company. And uh, we did something really interesting last year where when we started to notice that Monument Valley was becoming a success, uh, financially as well, we decided to reward everyone in the company equally. So we shared out 70% of the Monument Valley profits to everyone. Uh, to sort of show that it's everyone that has taken us to that uh, place, not just the select few. Okay, let's move down one level from the organization as a whole to the teams. And what do we do to build a strong team culture? Have you heard of the Marshmallow Challenge? Some of you? Uh, in short, it's a very popular team exercise. It's done all over the world. We do it a lot with our 
client. It's super simple, but uh, we've noticed that it delivers some really profound uh, lessons and insights into collaboration. Um, the task is simple. You basically have teams of four that has 18 minutes to each try to build the tallest freestanding structure with 20 sticks of spaghetti, one yard of tape, one yard of string, and a marshmallow that needs to sit on top. Um, when you start comparing the performance and the results of different teams, you get some really interesting lessons here. Guess who is the worst performers here? I didn't hear that, but you were probably right. It's business people. <laughs> uh, they fight, they cheat, they build lame structures. Uh, and who are the best performers? Yes, children, kids. And why is this? It's because no one there tried to be, become the CEO of Spaghetti Inc. There's no fighting, there's no cheating, um, there's no bullshit, there's no politics. They just experiment and explore effectively together as a group. And some of the things we're doing in terms of building strong teams. Uh, for us, it's all about collaboration. We focus a lot on collaboration in our teams. Um, the design, the, t the, the programming, the strategy, the craft, etc., is as important as ever, uh, but I think it's not enough anymore. Uh, you need to add collaboration skills to the mix uh, to smash it. Uh, so we focus a lot on this, and we do group dynamics, crash courses with every team when we kick off a new project so you understand what a team is and what state it is in and how you move forward, etc. We spend a lot of time on reflection. You will not be a good, good team from day one. It takes time, it takes practice. We reflect and we learn in retros. And maybe most importantly, we spend a lot of time encouraging people to talk about real stuff, talk about real feelings. Uh, it's, not, it's not often easy, but it's needed, I think. Uh, like this quote here, the essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action, while reason leads to conclusions. So I think today in the fast-moving world we live in, uh, we can't really uh, hold back, and it's only when we put our, you know, when we start to open up and talk about real things where we actually get to action, where we actually get to change. Um, and if we look at the marshmallow challenge again, if we look at the group of CEOs, they perform around average on, uh, as an average team. But the interesting thing here is that if you add one of the CEOs, PA, to that team, it almost always wins. And the reason for that is that the PA of often comes with some collaboration skills, some facilitation skills. The PA starts to encourage collaboration, encourage ideas, cross-pollinating ideas, encourage communication between these CEOs, um, and they always win. And that skill of facilitation, uh, of facilitating collaboration, uh, we have started to take a lot more seriously, and we have specific people, coaches, who spend their time only on designing, leading, and facilitating team processes. Super good. And this is a quick one. I think it's very easy to forget that, uh, to celebrate. Like, we, it's easy to celebrate the big events, but when you have a team improving over time, you also need to celebrate all the important everyday achievements. So we build celebration into our project processes, and each team have a budget to celebrate with that they need to use up. Um, okay, last one. Let's move down to the individual level here. Um, and I think it's... Uh, I'm not going to lie, even though I absolutely love my job, it's pretty messy, pretty chaotic. I think we still live in a world where people expect leaders to know the answers, to show the way, to not make mistakes, etc. Uh, and this sort of culture that I promote, where it's very transparent and obvious that I don't know what's going on most of the time, uh, it's not easy. Uh, but I'm not alone. In workplaces all around the world, research has shown that 80% of workers today don't know what to do when they come to work every day. They don't know what is expected of them. So this is the reality. And what can you do as an individual to combat this, to work with this? This is something we work with a lot. 
we refer to the concept as tough love. Um, I think with so much change going on, there's no, you can't really hold back anymore. Uh, you need to practice both giving and receiving feedback in a constructive, good way. Um, so we do that a lot, and no one escapes this. This is a piece of feedback I got about two years ago now. And they called me Marge at work, by the way. Um, so Marge, your leadership is non-existent. It was a bit more than that, but that is the highlight. And I felt pretty sick when I got this. Um, and it sort of marked like a new chapter in me. Like I think before that, I refer now to our culture at that time, our feedback culture at that time as a high-five culture. I was always there when someone did something good. You know, high-five, well done, amazing. Uh, but tough conversations, uh, when things wasn't going well, I avoided at all costs. And I think I was, the truth is, I was probably hiding behind my introversion, behind my role, etc. Uh, but this piece of feedback, it sort of marked a new chapter because I, I got it here, that this came from a good place. The intention was there. She gave me this feedback because she thought it would be good for the company if I leaned in more, if I took more responsibility, if I led more. Etc. And I wouldn't stand here today if it wasn't for this piece of feedback. So I think a good feedback culture today is super important, and it's not, it's not a nice to have, it's a, it's a must have. And on reflection, I think nothing I've talked about today is as important as this one to me. Um, great ideas, um, uh, good teams, strong people clever brains, etc. Uh, it's just a starting point. Uh, but what's really important is to have the right mindset. Um, and in this case, it's a growth mindset. Um, I think the symbol for our success now is probably Monument Valley. But few people realize they probably took us 25 products or, or so to get to that. Uh, but we worked super hard on learning at every step uh, and building a foundation to build upon from that. Um, and this is important, and I refer to it here as a sort of mindset shift from being a VIP, a very important person, to a WIP, to a work in progress. And I think the, it's the most important skill we need to have. Um, and here's a good quote. Here's a better quote, actually. I love quotes a little bit too much. At times of change, the learners are the ones that will inherit the world, while the knowers will be beautifully prepared for a world that no longer exists. Uh, and that's pretty much, uh, that sums it up. And, but it's not easy. Um, when you don't know how to handle a new situation, it, it's, it's frustrating. It's really hard. Um, so here's a piece of advice. When you walk into a situation that you have no idea how to deal with, and you can feel you're getting quite fr frustrated, try to think this. It's just another fucking growth opportunity. Um, and what I mean with that is that because things are moving so quickly now, and uh, there's so much change, and don't try to pretend you have the answers all, all the time. Uh, let go and focus on learning. And when you start looking at the world in this way, it, it, it changes things big time. Um, but it needs some self-compassion to do this, or put in another way. Uh, smile about it. Smile about life, smile about this situation, and make sure people around, it, around you do the same. Thank you.